Right. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Uh, and thanks for attending our digital takeout uh, and put on by the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, as well as USU's Career Services. I uh, want to first thank everyone who's here today. Uh, before we begin, I just want everyone to feel free to use the chat function. Uh, let us know if you're having any technical difficulties, and, as well as the question and answer uh, feature to ask any questions throughout the presentation here. Uh, and then I know it can be you know, a little bit difficult not being able to see the, everyone else who's there. So if you guys wouldn't mind, whoever's out there already, um, to just put a, a welcome in the chat. Tell me you know, what your name is, what college you're from, uh, and or if you're already graduated, where you're currently working. Uh, and then we're going to turn the time over pretty soon. We want to welcome uh, Ted Twinting here. He is an, uh, a graduate uh, from USU. He has a Bachelor of Arts in History and French from 2009, as well as a Master's of Science in Management uh, from the University of Maryland. He's had experience working with the uh, International Monetary Fund as well as with here in Utah Public Radio. Uh, he's currently the Director of Sales and Marketing for McKinnon Mulherin. And today he's going to talk with us a little bit about LinkedIn, how to develop your LinkedIn profile as well as how to make it uh, really successful. And take it away, Ted. Thank you, Mr. Banks, or Joe, if I could. Um, Want to thank you for your time. And I want to thank everybody for joining us, uh, both watching now as well as the uh, many people who are watching in the future as well. Um, my name is Ted Twinting, and I believe we are now uh, sharing. This is my first rodeo in WebEx. Um, I tend to use Zoom a lot, but that is totally fine. Um, Joe, I completely forgot. We just did this. <laughs> More yeah, options. <laughs> yeah, share screen. Oh, there it is. <laughs> there we are. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, excellent. Are we there now? Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you, everybody, for, for holding on for that. So the first thing I want to start off is sort of talking about my career path and how I got to where I am today, as well as um, obviously we'll have an, a bit about the uh, ways to contract for LinkedIn. Um, so the first thing is I want to say is my career has been anything but traditional or planned. Uh, a lot of my career was dictated by graduating in the middle of a crisis. And in my case, it was the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. And just for a little perspective, the quarter that I graduated, I saw around 1.2 million jobs lost. And for anybody graduating right now, I feel for you. I faced down big questions at that time like uh, how do I do what I love? How do I do what I care about? And, um, and also help support the organization um, that allows me to do those things. So in 2009, I graduated with uh, degrees from USU in history and French. Um, both of them had amazing opportunities with them. For example, I did the wonderful um, EFALP study abroad program with French and um, also with history, I got to do a full deep dive into, uh, for me, it was really interesting, but uh, 19th century reform. So <laughs> it was really cool to sort of do some original research as well. Um, and yeah, so in from 2010 to 2015, I worked in varying positions at in Washington, DC. And the CHAS degrees, prepped me by uh, fortifying my abilities to carefully and methodically think through varying situations. Uh, especially my history degree, like I mentioned, it gave me the confidence that the world continues turning and that it is important to keep the big picture in mind. Um, you can you can, you can can lightning focus on one thing in history and then you figure out that it's, it's not this one individual instance that, that tells the story. It is a 150 plus year picture. So I think that's really helpful to keep in mind, especially in times of crisis. Um, also because of the backing, I had a very successful career throughout DC and working in, for entities such as the Canadian Embassy and the International Monetary Fund and a regional not-for-profit that is called Rebuilding Together. So from my French degree, it provided me the ability to work in the language of the Canadian Embassy. As anybody knows, French and English are the two official languages of Canada. And so I used everything I learned from my French degree uh, through USU and actually uh, operationalized it at working every single day. Same with IMF. I was responsible for a portfolio of Francophone countries, um, specifically with public financial management. But beyond just the actual uh, sort of boots on the ground reality of needing to be able to 
uh, work in a bilingual environment, it gave me the insight on how to empathize and understand um, the intricacies and power of language. So uh, anybody who's ever learned a foreign language and has sort of picked up on idiomatic phrases um, knows that you can't really use them in English because you've probably had to face down somebody who used an idiomatic phrase and it didn't really make total sense. And so it was that sort of basic level of communication um, that really sort of picked me up with French. The other thing that Chast primed me for is um, the core belief in being a lifelong learner. And so because of that, while I was in DC, I earned a Master's of Science and Management from either University of Maryland, University of Maryland University College, or University of Maryland Global Campus. It's been all three of those things <laughs> since I went to school there. Um, and it, it was a master's degree in management with a focus in nonprofit and association management. And I initially start on, started off thinking, you know, I want to be the person making the change. I want to be the project person who is, you know, um, doing the research specifically uh, for history or going out and speaking with these uh, disadvantaged populations. But as I was studying, I figured out that it was actually, um, it was the, the business side of the not-for-profits that I was really interested in. And so I started picking up on fundraising. And I, I personally think that not a small part of that is because of when I graduated, I just watched organizations fall to the side, right? Again, 1.2 million job losses in a quarter is a little scary for a fresh grad. So anybody who is facing that down, um, I feel you, but I promise, I promise, keep the faith, use your degree and, and things will get absolutely better. Um, so as I started picking up on fundraising, as I started looking at how to create organizations, how to create sort of strong partnerships, I realized the absolutely steadfast importance of maintaining relationships. Um, so it was my skills that I learned from CHAS, my skills that I learned from USU, as well as the collaboration of my professional experience that um, I noticed a LinkedIn posting from this little organization called Utah State University. And I was actually welcomed back to my alma mater with opening arms as a development officer for Utah Public Radio, um, specifically, uh, or sorry, with the College of Humanities and Social Science, specifically Utah Public Radio. Um, while I was there, I had some truly amazing times with UPR. Uh, we did some phenomenal projects, again, based upon the power of relationships, and I would encourage everyone to go to upr.org and check them out. Um, Joe, I'm gonna hijack this real quick, and I'm just gonna give a quick plug for UPR and all the great work that they um, did and are currently doing. Some of the series I worked on were like um, opioids, state of addiction, objectified more than a body, um, uh, uh, 54 strong, and so, so many more. Each of those was funded by an outside organization that we partnered with, and it was because of longstanding partnerships that those were possible. Um, while I'm no longer part of UPR, um, much to my chagrin, no offense to McKinnon Mulhern, because I absolutely love what I'm doing now, but they do continue to do some amazing projects. And so I encourage everyone to check out Project Resilience, again, either on upr.org, or during morning edition and all things considered. Um, also, pledge early, pledge often. Okay, I'm done, I promise, Joe, I won't do that again. Um, so while I was at USU, I was actually going through the wonderful publication that they put out called Liberalis, and I noted an article about the career success of Paige Frame. Now, she was somebody I knew during my time at USU, and so I reached out on LinkedIn, and I reignited that relationship. Uh, we met for coffee, had a, you know, caught up on old times, talked about what we were doing, and just sort of had a very background conversation for maybe a year or so. I was then featured in a, an article in Liberalis. I believe it was about Objectify, but um, have to double check on that. And then Paige reached out again on LinkedIn. And then one day in 2018, while I was super happy with my, my time at USU, I did notice a position for a sales, or a, a posting for a sales position with McKinnon Mulhern. And again, while I was not specifically looking for a new role, I did reach out and through a pretty intensive interview and vetting process, I was extended an offer to work with McKinnon Mulhern. And I have to say, I adore my current organization. They're professional, they're forward looking, they're adaptive, they're innovative. And these are just some of the quick fire reasons why I like working with them so much. Every day I get to learn something new, I knew, I knew instructional design, proofing, and editing was part of the field, but before I joined, I did not know the incredible intricacies 
of and the uh, diehard debates that people have about everything from an Oxford comma to the best way to pass on um, deep institutional knowledge and gain skills. I mean, everybody who is part of CHAS is interested in creating uh, knowledge. And I get to do that every single day and work with organizations that are interested in doing that every single day. So basically everything that I have boils down to um, the importance of relationships and a not small part of my career is actually owed directly to this little organization or this little website called LinkedIn. So I think that we should probably get around to it. Oh, <laughs> I forgot. I was also promoted to the director of sales and marketing in 2019 at McKinnon Marn. you know, just a small little, small little bit there. And so that's, that's where I am today. So, like I said, a little uh, LinkedIn tips and tricks is what everybody actually came here to hear about, not specifically me. Um, but I had a much longer presentation, as you've already seen from the last 12 minutes, I'm a bit of a talker. So I trimmed it down to be three basic things, and I think that that's a good takeaway. So what I would encourage everybody watching to do is to, to take out a pen, take out a piece of paper um, to be able to write a few things down because there are some actionable steps that you can take today to help make your LinkedIn profile just a little bit better, all right? And if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, I highly recommend you build one. Um, the first one is, I want you to get out, a pen and, get out that pen and paper and write down what makes you as a person professionally unique. What is it that makes you you? What are the things that you bring to the table and what is it that you want to do? Sort of start, picking and choosing all of the varying things of, of a deep reflection on how the value that you bring to the organization, okay? Now, I want you to write down your audience. Try to think who is it that's going to be looking at your profile? Who is it that you are going to be trying to engage? Are you looking at, um, for example, uh, the Washington Post? Um, if you're in journalism and communications, or are you looking to be um, on the corporate side and uh, serve in PR? Okay, so start thinking about who is it that's going to be reading it, um, and not even specifically if you're going for the corporate route, it's not just the big organization, but specifically HR individuals in that organization. Okay. Also start looking at all of the other competition that you'll be working with in the job market and start seeing what is reflected in their per in their profiles. And so what can you do to help stand out? And then finally, and I'm, I'm plowing through this, um, you can get the basic ideas, but you can go ahead and come back later and sort of uh, spend a little bit more time working on this. Now I want you to take a little bit of time and write down maybe five keywords that tie everything together. So what, what's your professional value proposition as well as the audience and where you want to be. Speaking of which, you should make sure that you are writing for where you want to be. As opposed to a lot of other social media platforms, LinkedIn is absolutely not about you, but about your audience. Um, it is important to remember that while your LinkedIn profile is a representation of your knowledge, skills, and abilities, it is specifically for other people to look at you and try to figure out how, how they can work with you and what you can bring to the company. So if we start at the top, um, while it's not writing specifically, I want you to make sure that your picture is professional. What I tell my people internally is try to make it so that if you were to walk into a meeting with uh, 20 other people who don't recognize you, they should be able to know from your profile pic, oh, that's you. Is your profile pic from 10 years ago? Is it from um, a casual picture that you took that you thought just really highlighted um, your smize or something else? That's not really what we're looking for. What we're looking for is something that is close, that is bright, and that makes you look good. Try to keep it at least 400 by 400 pixels. And while we're at it, also take a look at your background. Does it relate to your professional value proposition and is it reflective of your audience? For many years, mine was the background of the beautiful Bear River Mountains because they have a deep place in my heart. However, 
that doesn't really do anything. If you look now, you'll see that it is um, actually a, a branding campaign that we used at my current organization that we had our graphic designer create. And so everybody at McKinnon Mulhern, or many of the people at McKinnon Mulhern, excuse me, have a, a consistent banner that demonstrates camaraderie, teammanship, and sort of creates a collective identity. So for us, that works really well, especially as a virtual company to help show that we are part of the same team. Also try to keep it at about 1500 by 300 uh, pixels for your background as well. Okay, if we keep moving down, you want to make sure that you look at your headline. Um, it should be shorter than a tweet, about 120 characters. And try again, and you're going to notice a theme here for people keep, uh, keeping track, you're trying to write for your audience. Um, would a very judgmental stranger be able to say so what about you after reading it? And it doesn't have to be specifically, um, you know, I, I'm capable in this, 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 and this. There's a lot of other opportunities there. What you're trying to do is grab somebody and bring it in. You're trying to make sure that they can say, oh, um, you know, th that's exactly what this person does. For example, mine, and I think it's genius. I think it's good. Other people may not, but again, um, it represents me, is all mine says is that I connect people. And that is essentially what I do. All I do every single day is get smart people and smart people to talk to each other. So for me, I think that works because of my role. It's an ambiguous and specific enough that it helps tie people together. So follow what you will, follow what your market tells you. Again, see what your competition does and try to consider it. The last thing to think is after reading it, do you care? If you don't care about it, I promise you nobody else will. So try to make it so it resonates with you. And this is a good point to think about how you are trying to be authentic during your LinkedIn profile. There's always the resume that says that somebody has spent 25 years working in Word and they're actually only 18 years old. So you want to make sure that your profile consistently throughout demonstrates actually what your knowledge, skills, and abilities are. So if we move beyond the headline, we're going to start looking at your experience. Now, this is the meat and potatoes of your profile. Make sure it is relevant, it is accurate, and I don't think I'm biased because I work for an organization that provides this service, but make sure you proofread your res or your uh, your experience section. Really, you should proofread your whole profile, but always make sure you experience or you proofread your experience section. Um, don't be like me where you just start talking and the wrong words come out. You don't want that in your experience profile. Okay. Um, this is how you present yourself to the world, and the biggest thing is make sure that it fits you. LinkedIn will pull keywords from everywhere in your profile and we'll get to some skills and some other stuff later that it does but it also pulls it from your experience and so if you want to be uh, served up the kind of job opportunities um, that are out there make sure that your experience profile reflects where you want to be just because you've done something in your experience write to your audience don't just say that you have um, and I should have come up with an example earlier, but don't just say that you helped create, you know, a training manual. Talk about it. How did you operationalize it? Did you did you work with SMEs? Did you um, uh, uh, pull a lot of information together to create a succinct and concise statement? Um, that would be great if you're trying to become a tech, uh, an editor or something like that in the future, right? So try to write for where you want to be, not specifically just I did this, this, and this. Um, if you happen to have, I don't know, an internship and you're looking to be uh, with uh, the College of Humanities and Social Science as an events coordinator and uh, marketing person, then make sure that you reflect that experience to be specifically for where you want to be in the future. Finally, uh, we're going to look at skills on this page. Okay. I don't want to hear specifically about how you are uh, skilled in the Microsoft Office Suite. Okay. Um, everybody who has graduated university has a, a wor workable familiarity with Office. Make sure that you are specific. Make sure that you are saying that you are great at PowerPoint. Make sure that you are saying that you are great at Microsoft Project, if you are. Try to be as specific as possible and try to get endorsements from people that matter in your field. It is great if your roommate thinks that you are just the best editor in the world or that you are great at PowerPoint because you figured out an animation or two, but that doesn't really carry too much weight. Um, LinkedIn's algorithm will actually weigh the experience, network, and everything of people that give you um, endorsements. 
And so make sure that you're getting endorsements from people that matter in your field. Finally, uh, it is better to have a, a few endorsed skills than many useless and unsupported ones. Um, anybody who's familiar with uh, website development, it is good to think about these as sort of zombie pages. You don't want a bunch of skills that are just sort of out there um, that haven't been supported, that aren't mentioned elsewhere in your profile, or else as LinkedIn sort of looks through it, it'll say, you know what, they just put this here, it's not reflected in their experience, I bet they're not actually really good at this skill. So you want to make sure that throughout your entire profile, you have um, served up the, uh, the, the, the menu that's needed for the algorithm, as well as for the human people that will be reading your profile. I want to make a final plug here for making sure that you keep it honest. Again, let's go back to that um, that resume where uh, somebody says that they've experienced they have experience in Word for 25 years, but they're only 18 years old. You don't want to do that. That's an instant uh, shot in the foot for anybody for any prospective job employer. It's important to remember that if you have one feverish night of updating your LinkedIn profile, say tonight after this wonderful opportunity provided by Chas. Um, that's not enough. You have to make sure that you keep it updated. As you work through your profile, don't just set and forget. This LinkedIn is very much um, easy to do, but hard to do well. So if you remain active on LinkedIn, um, you can really, that's where you really uh, reap the benefits of your time, energy, and effort that you have put into your now perfectly outlined profile couple of ideas for that is that LinkedIn has both both posts and articles. So posts should be quick and relevant and they're intended to spark interaction. So something like um, say you know uh, my senior thesis is on this and I research this person or I'm developing um, this. That's a good thing to sort of uh, put out there to sort of demonstrate what you are interested in, demonstrate what your uh, industry is interested in and sort of the relevant information therein. Articles, however, are more of a deep dive, intimidated, uh, not intimidating, <laughs> intended to demonstrate competence. So you really wanna make sure that your articles are uh, about, um, there's there's varying research on this, but currently 2000 words is, a, is sort of the, the average uh, best practice for lengthy blogs and articles but it is totally fine to go the other way and have it be about 250 words as well. So it kind of depends on what you're intending to do. And also there are um, different ways that you can write it. And that go, sort of goes into the whole be honest and be authentic. Don't try to push something out the door that is just packed with words to try to increase how you look. If, if you have the content, you have the interest and you have the availability, then you can create the long, competent article. Whereas something, if you're just saying, um, here's an update on something I learned at a conference, then that is perfectly fine as well. If you want it to be one sentence paragraph, one sentence paragraph, that's great. Or if you just want extensively research with, with headings and subheadings, you can do that as well. Also, um, when should you post for um, postings, right? So the first one is that they should be under 100 characters. Uh, that's sort of what you're looking at um, for the status update. The cutoff point of when you're looking in the river of LinkedIn is approximately 220 characters. It kind of varies if what platform you're on and how big your screen is, but 220 characters is about the, the average recommended length. And also include an image and other media. Um, the more that somebody clicks on the image or the see more in LinkedIn, the more that LinkedIn will then turn around and serve it up to other people in your audience. This is a great thing to go back again and reflect on your professional value statement. What is it that you are trying to bring to the uh, future organization that you want to join? Everything that you're doing should be building up to where you want to be. LinkedIn is not a, 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 a representation of where you have been. It should read as a manual to where you want to be. So. Make, making sure you're active with stuff like articles and postings and stuff like that, that is a great way to sort of forward um, forward uh, proof your, your LinkedIn profile. So then if in a year somebody decides to come in and look at your profile, you have this giant body of work and interaction and expertise and authority, and you can actually just show way more with a fully fleshed out profile than you can in a very important cover letter, for example. 
it, it really just demonstrates that you are you are who you say you are. Look at all this evidence to, to demonstrate that. Couple other quick tips, and then I think, uh, Joe, if we can, we could jump to some Q&A, but use those keywords. Use those keywords throughout, those ones that I had you write down earlier. Try to make it so that you, if it is PR, PR is mentioned throughout, or whatever it is that you want to be, uh, whatever connects your value statement with your audience, try to make sure that those keywords show up as frequently as possible. Also, add your city to your profile. Um, LinkedIn serves up regionality uh, in uh, their postings pretty regularly. However, I have to say, as working for a virtual company, um, we have people across the, the United States. And so while it is important, it is, not, um, it is not the most critical thing. There is an opportunity to um, demonstrate examples of things you have worked on. So in, insert your impressive work samples. I highly recommend that you include as many samples as you can. And when you look at those samples, definitely make sure that they have been proofed, edited, and they are what you want to show in your portfolio of work. Also, and again, this could be because I have a master's degree in nonprofit and association management, but showcase your volunteer and your charitable interest. It is a great way to again show, look, not only am I doing this professionally, but I am truly passionate about communications because I am helping this local not-for-profit get their message out to their community. And then finally, make sure that you join industry centric groups and not only join them, but be active in those groups. So this is a pretty quick presentation, but I wanted to, instead of going into a deep dive again, I have like a 16 slide presentation on this. I wanted to boil this down to the most useful and actionable things that I think are helpful in uh, for uh, the 2020 for people that, uh, could be looking at entering the job market or in the job market and are looking to um, uh, uh, further their career currently. So with that, I'd like to pass it over back to you, uh, Joe. And um, I think I did that right. Yes, I did. Yep. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to uh, open it up for some Q&A. Great. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Ted. Okay, so you mentioned while you're talking um, the importance of getting endorsements as well as um, referrals, you know, different things on your LinkedIn profile. Uh, what's a good way to approach people in, you know, that in getting those referrals to post on the LinkedIn? That's a great question, Joe. Um, I like first by thinking to identify who in my network would a recommendation or endorsement help really boost my profile. Again, it goes back to um, maybe my roommate really likes me, and so they're going to write up a great referral. Obviously, nothing is better, or something is better than nothing, rather. However, um, it's good to look at thinking maybe your senior advisor, maybe your current boss, or maybe somebody in an organization, ideally, that you want to join would be a wonderful thing. I think it's important to also remember that everybody is especially busy, um, especially in our current COVID climate. Everybody is trying to uh, work from home with three, one, two kids, cats, dogs, uh, whatever the case may be. And so because of that, I think it is always great to try to help them land the plane and draft out a recommendation um, for them and say, hey, I know that we've worked together on this. I have drafted this. Would you be comfortable editing it and, uh, and, and endorsing me on that? Or providing a recommendation, excuse me. Um, I think that that's a really good idea to help busy people, busy important people, uh, secure uh, that sort of recommendation. Um, also, I think that it is important to remember that every request is not going to work out. And so don't put all your eggs in one basket. It's better to have a couple of ideas out there because worst case scenario, you're going to get a couple of recommendations. All right, thanks. Um, another question I had. Um... So obviously, you know, LinkedIn is about building relationships um, and not just connecting and getting as many people as possible, but actually maintaining those relationships. Um, what would you recommend for that students should do in order to maintain the relationships they build on LinkedIn, especially when they're not actively seeking positions in the workforce? I think that's great. Um, yeah, LinkedIn, like I said, is really easy uh, to to initially do, but hard to do well. And that this is part of that hard to do well. Um, it's very much what you make of it. And so staying on top of trends, posting research in your field are some ways that you can make sure that you have uh, 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 
I'm going to say it, a robust presence and try to remain top of mind with your network. It's important to not just share like inspirational quotes, right? Like every day is what you make of it. Like we all need as much inspiration as we can today, uh, especially in our COVID climate. However, um, if you provide substantive, strong content and comment, like interact with the substance and strong comment of others, that is a great way to, while you're while you're perfectly happy, happy in a current position, to be able to really build that network. And again, like I said, stay top of mind because that's really what it meant. That's really what's important is building those relationships, keeping those connections alive. And it shows your authenticity in both maintaining relationships as well as your commitment or ability to build up a cause. So I would say um, commenting on others, liking posts, um, engaging in professional networks, everything like that is a great way to uh, provide leadership for yourself in that kind of organization or in that kind of environment, excuse me. Oh, I think you're on mute, Joe. Yeah, so those are my uh, initial questions there. Um, London, would you help us out if any other questions come up? Yeah, um, I have a couple other questions for you, Ted, if that's all right. I'd love it. So one of my first ones I have is, what advice do you have for someone that thinks jumping into LinkedIn sounds a little intimidating or a little scary? Um, I think that it is uh, vitally important to look forward and just do the best you can, right? Uh, for, I don't know, four years, my LinkedIn was absolute garbage. Um, it was no good. I didn't really look at what would make it good. Um, I just copy and pasted my resume and put it in there. But I still was building my network. I was starting to to create those kind of relationships, especially the ones that I was making at USU that, for example, as I can show you with my current position, ultimately pay off in the long run. So while once it was talking, my LinkedIn talked about how I was the uh, cafe manager at the USU Taggart Center coffee cart, which no longer exists, too early, too early. I wish it was still there. Um, I have since removed that from my LinkedIn. So starting it and just doing it, trying it out, failing, I think that's the best way to be. Um, also, I would encourage anybody to uh, email me and I'd be happy to help them set it up. Um, I also have a checklist um, that I've generated as well as, and I've been told that the word audit is too strong of a word. So instead I'm gonna call it um, a review, right? I, I can help review a LinkedIn profile to sort of say, here's where it's strong, here's where it's not so strong, um, here are some recommendations on how to marry the two. So uh, I would say um, the unfortunate advice is, is go for it and fail and that's okay. Um, it's better to build a network than to have none. Hey, sounds good, thank you for that. Um, another question for you. What are some of the most important skills someone can show from a chast degree on their LinkedIn? Everybody who is interested um, in pursuing any kind of chast major is a good communicator and puts a value on communication. And across the board, I can tell you there are many, many people who are not great communicators, and it is a highly sought after and valuable skill across the professional world. Uh, anything that you do, any volunteer experience, any uh, particular uh, ability to synthesize an argument is a valuable thing to put forward. And it's, I think it's okay early on, if you don't have extensive work history, to highlight your experience as time at USU. So, for example, you could say, instead of a job, you could say USU degree, and then list everything that you're proud of and all the skills that you attained at that point to help build it. Now, again, it might be like how I removed the cafe manager um, from my from my LinkedIn profile and subsequent resumes as well. Um, but it's a great starting point to help sort of start building that um, building that network and building that that place in the market. Thanks to both of you, and thank you so much for everybody who attended. Um, again, if you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn, um, feel free to, and I'd be happy to help you out with your profile and or just talk to you more about the incredible value that I've personally found with the Chas degree. All right. Thanks again, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone.